That was Sons of Arca from their album Cosmic Jungle Bandy, and I'm delighted to welcome to the show Professor Stanley Unwin. Stanley, you've worked many times with the Sons of Arca. When did you first meet them? Oh yes, yes indeed. It was an autumnal afternoon when I first met Sons of Arca. It was a dull day in Dockland, east end of London. It was made bright by an enthusiastic gathering in a subterranean recording studio, you know, all down the earth there like Orpheus and the undergrowth. They had their instruments all tuny hubber and ready to go into music holly. Oh, joy. The guiding light of Sons of Arca is known as Wadada. How did you get to know him and what do you think of his musical philosophy? Well, we first met on the long-distance telephoto. I immediately detected his interest in the comparative of the religions and the reconciliation of the multi-religion thinking in the myload of the people. If you like, a code of behold, you know, uh, and mutual tolerating throughout the ages. Oh, it's a timeless thing, all rather profoundy. I thought Arca had a good point there. You did a single many years ago with the Sons of Arca called Erasmus Meets the Earthling. We're going to hear that track in a moment, but can you first tell me a bit more about the philosopher Erasmus? Oh yes, yes indeed. Uh, I mean, Desiderius Erasmus uh, was of course a widely travelled man, all over the globe, Huffalo Doubter. I mean, he loved letter writing, Scribbly Ho, and we have over 3,000 of these today, you know. He was uh, also a friend of Sir Thomas More, who disagreed about Henry VIII being top of the church load, as you know, Rex Fidelio and all that. And, of course, therefore, he had his head off in Chopney, didn't he, Block? Oh, folly, that was sad, yeah. Yes, Erasmus greatly influenced the uh, Reformation, well, and disagreed with Marty Luther quite a bit, you know, but there was no fisty covers, you see, because Erasmus was a very gentle man there, who little approach for a little gesture, softly persuaded her in his words, oh, there was a great communicators of joy in that. Stanley, in that track, you also mention William Shakespeare. Now, what do you think about him? I believe Shakespeare was the greatest satirist of all, you know. His subtle humour, deep in the brain bocker of his mile, allowed him to put all the serious things of his day, like royalty there, old crown, Auburn scepter and dangly, <laughs> politicals, what, social behold, egotism there, and snobbery, oh, up nose and sticky how, if you understand me. <laughs> he put all these into perspective. His genius was that he was able to entertain everybody and avoid offensive of to those if you might otherwise have him behead and chop me off like uh, Thomas More, you see, or perhaps even assassinated. Because like his contemporary Christopher Marlowe, who, as you know, uh, had a knife and snappy in the chest there in depth that in south-east London. Oh, folly. I understand you're very much into poetry. So what are your thoughts, for example, on Coleridge and Wordsworth? Oh, that's a question, Splendy Ho, yes. Yes, you see, a whole programme could be covered on these two great poets, uh, each so different in character and convey the broad canvas of humanity focus in their imaginative thinking. Now, take Coleridge's Ancient Man and Mariner or Kubla Khan. Now, one, the vivid word picture of a violent sea, their rushing waves runs, man overboard, rah, ooh, this folly. What, the rugged rocks, rocks and endurance of man at odds, and yet it were in harmony with the great forces of the cosmos. Now, with Wordsworth, the subtle beauties at the other end of the spectrum, well, in nature, in solitude, like wandering lonely as a cloud all dangling in the heavenly bode, and suddenly that host of Duffy Down Dillies all jumping up low down it in the breeze, what? Just like his heart does at the end, when on his couch in pensive moody lie, thoughts flash upon his inward eyeball. I mean, that is really Wordsworth uh, giving it his most capunicae of the joys of nature itself. Tell me, have you heard of Ralph Waldo Trine? Trine? No. No, I fear Mr Trine seems to escape my curriculum. You see, I wonder if perhaps his first names were taken from Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, the sage of Concord or Massachusetts. Uh, the nearest name that comes to my mind is the Antipodean S. Trine, who used the pseudonym Trine as an alternative form of English Australian to communicate idiomatically, a uh, down under, you see. You see, Cobber, uh, the, the way to talk down under is to invent your own language, which they do so well, and call it strine, you see. Now, you've an amazing gift of language, and it seems to me an intuitive feel for rhyme and rhythm. Well, I believe it was based on the desire to emulate all the writers, both comic and serious, whose works had fascinated me since childhood. 
My, by accident, I found that in a difficult situation, when in a desperately nervous state, I tried to explain to a policeman why I was facing the wrong way, half a load down the street, uh, what, my words just jumbled out, but containing the gist of my predicament, which I was in. Now, the policeman was most helpful because he understood my meaning, you see, but later, when he thought about it, my BBC colleague laughed so much, I found that my language vehicle could be used to entertain people who a little give a chuck load or a smile with fold, anything like that. Not so much a belly laugh, though, but a little lip smiley that creating keeps on and on and on. Oh, yes. Absolutely fascinating. What do you think of the rap movement, and where do you think this talking in music comes from? Well, I feel that rap artists need a particular mood for the enjoyment and performance of their work. I believe it's a mistake to think of rap as music alone. It's the combinators of monologue and the music backy, if you understand me, and perhaps in a way it could be considered as a reportage of the human scene, like the folk music and that. And apart from this, I'm looking forward to more analysis of this art. Oh, yes. We'll be listening a little later to some other tracks you did with Sons of Arca, Sostenuto off to Pluto, and then the very first track you did together, Deep Journey. These tracks seem to be asking the purpose of the universe, about its beginnings and where it's going to end. What a profound equesty ho Well, in cosmic terms, the universe must be a continuum, mustn't it? Otherwise, it would need to be contained within another something, you see, something within something else. Now, I personally would describe the universe as unbounded and infinite. But I do believe also that it could be defined more clearly to more of us when our senses are further developed at Hoad to comprehend its infinite wonder. I believe that human strife and wars may be delaying the furtherance of this knowledge we can pack in our brain box to become more perfect. Going to be difficult, isn't it? Oh, yes. And where does God fit into all this? What do you think God is? The supreme being of the universe who gives us free will either to destroy ourselves or to use what he has given us to make what we decide to be the best of it, yes. Well, I believe that each one of us is a part of the sum total force existed in the cosmos, you see. And what do you think will happen at the end of life's journey? Oh, how can one begin to answer this one? I mean, when we're buried in the ground, our bodies slowly disintegrate us, become part of Mother Earth there, the worms creep and crawl in, centipedals, and all these creep and huffalo down our bodies. Whoa. And now, look, if we're cremated, we become part of the heat, which rises up the uh, crematorium chim load up into the heavenly bone. I mean, as I said, we become part of the sum total force of the universe. We couldn't be more equal than that, don't you think? OK, so let's move on to another somewhat controversial subject. Do you think we should still be eating animals, and can we really communicate with them? Well, naturally, our communication with animals is a vehicle of instinct, you know. It's all in the myload. Uh, if they like what they smell in us, and that is to say, they go, human beal, human beal, yeah, sniffy, yeah. And if they like the sounds we make in our approach to them and those smells, they're more likely to respond in a friendly way to our advances, aren't they? I mean, from time immemorial, even in biblical days, we've eaten animals and suffered down the throcus. I mean, what about cannibals? You ask, should we still be eating animals? Well, my conscience says no. I enjoy a tender steak less and less each time I see one on my plate there. And then I think about the agonised cry of a nice, crisp cos lettuce as I bite its heart out. <coughs> Pass the salt, ducky. But I will try to stop eating meat before I die. Colours. Do you think there are any more colours, or have we seen them all? And how do they relate to sound? I do not believe there are any more colours. Of course, there are more than we see directly in the rainbow. I mean, the shades of the combinations of the three primaries and their intermixy ho I mean, they relate to sound, since you ask, through their juxtaposition within the spectrode itself. The whole spectrode, uh, the uh, whole of life and cosmos and everything is a sort of spectrum. It contains all these things. Now, rather in the way, shall we say, Indian and other musical cultures compare with that of the Western worm, with their quarter tones there, instead of whole tones and half tones they have quarter tones you see and the glissando like that see 
Ravi Chisanko and all these wonderful players. Now, any possible extension of these senses may come given an interrupted development of the human species. Oh, yes. Tell me, do you think there's music on other planets? And does it some sort of divine purpose? Divine? Well, we sometimes express music as divine, don't we? For example, in the slow a movement of Mozart's clarinet concerto, or perhaps in parts of Bach's and Matthew Passion. But I don't see it as having a more divine purpose than the creation itself, which of course is the great design uh, and most divine thing uh, one can begin to imagine with the limits of our, our, our thinking at all. Uh, regarding other planetary music, we may confirm early in the next century uh, that this music may be very similar to our own uh, inspired stuff, you know. As for the nearest solar system, we'll take Alpha in Centauri. Now, if we get there before they come to us, we can do a compare thunderbolt, can't we? The musical nopers, rhythmic contrapole, tonic sulfadi, stuffly no-takers, all these things. Oh, yes. Stanley, thank you so much for joining us. And before you go, do you have a message for any young people who may be listening? Well, thank you for inviting me into the world of Arca. Yes, I would like to suggest in my 83rd year a few words which I think from experience uh, certainly brought hope to me, and I hope this may be, help the young people too. I found these words to be moderation, tolerance, loyalty, love, stability and truth. Uh, I've put them in that order because uh, I think the last one is the most important, truth, of course. Uh, but love is so close to it, uh, you could almost bracket them together. But, of course, stability, you see, we must have. Otherwise, you can't, uh, we shan't be able to go forward, shall we, and begin to understand those things which you, you questioned me of so deeply today. Oh, yes. Do try to read works done by authors who stand for these qualities, and your teachers or parents may be able to help you here. Oh, yes. Well, thank you for those very wise words.